in this lecture, I'm going to look a little bit at the different ways that different societies fetishize the female body. So when I say that I want to talk about the fetishization of the female form, you're like, whoa, sexy fetishes? Now, fetish is a term that's used in anthropology very broadly. I use it in religious studies a lot, and it refers to any object that humans create that is believed to have some kind of supernatural ability, that is infused with some kind of magic, and thus has the ability to control human beings. So to fetishize something is to say, hey, this thing has some kind of ineffable, like ununderstandable, like totally like magical power over other humans. And like it can make humans do things. That's what a fetish is, a magical object. And the issue is that we have increasingly fetishized the female form throughout American society as well as other societies abroad very broad conceptions of beauty around the world, what qualifies as beautiful. Like it's not the same in every country. It's not like there's one standard view of what beauty is. But one thing that is kind of universal in a strange way is that we exaggerate women's bodies, physically exaggerate women's bodies in order to fetishize them, sexualize them, objectify them, etc. And so I wanna talk about a few cases from around the world that make this really evident. So the first example I want to use is neck stretching. And this is actually a process that some women go through in parts of sub-Saharan Africa, as well as in places like Myanmar and Thailand and Southeast Asia, where at a very, very young age, young girls have usually a copper or brass bar that is wrapped around their neck. And it slowly is tightened to stretch the girl's neck. So what actually happens is as the rings are wrapped around, as the bar is wrapped around the girl's neck and creates the rings, it pushes her chin up and causes her as she grows to widen the spaces in between her neck vertebrae. And as time passes, you tighten the bar a little bit, wrap around it, uh, it another time to create another ring. And over time, this stretches the neck. So it takes about 20 years of continual stretching, rebanding, etc., to grow women's necks. There is a video which is included in this week's lecture that is an absolute must watch. It's only a couple of minutes, but it helps explain this phenomenon more. This has largely been phased out because it does cause a lot of health issues and health concerns for these women, particularly related to like weaknesses in their spinal columns. Um, but we do still see it in some regions, especially in Southeast Asia, because of tourism. So when I was in Thailand, I had the opportunity, I chose not to, but I had the opportunity to go to a village where the only way that this village makes money primarily is have, having tourists come in to look at the girls with their stretched necks. Um, I opted not to go because I don't think that that's necessarily a really ethnographically positive thing to do. Um, because it basically encourages these young girls to continue an unhealthy and unsafe practice just to please tourists. Um, but it is something that still exists in parts of Southeast Asia, again, primarily because of the tourist industry. Now, one example of fetishization of the female form that thankfully has, for the most part, disappeared, has pretty much entirely disappeared, is foot binding. And foot binding is a real thing. I've talked to people who are like, oh no, this didn't happen. Yes, it has. I, I have anthropologist friends who work in China that have met women with bound feet and have looked at them. I mean, it, it's a real phenomenon. And foot binding began in the 10th century in China. It was actually a process where young girls, two, three, four years old, would have their feet bound and wrapped up in uh, fabrics. And this caused the bones to grow in a different shape. You can see some of the x-rays and models here to actually show how the changes would occur. And the end result would be that their toes and the front of their feet would wrap up under their feet, causing their feet to be very, very tiny and petite and pointy in this weird shape. And they would wear these rather cute little shoes that made them look like little dolls, essentially. And if you're asking like, why would women do this? Not all women did this, not at all. Not all, most Chinese women did not do this. This was something that only very, very wealthy families did. So like if you were a poor peasant, like you didn't wrap your children's, your, your little girl's feet because you needed her to work out in the fields with you and she had to be able to walk. Whereas if you were a wealthy, wealthy elite, the way that you showed just how wealthy your family was, was that none of its women ever had to walk. 
Because when you bind women's feet like this, they can't walk. They have to be carried around. They actually have to be carried around in a chair or carried around by arms because they can't put weight on their feet. So you essentially are paralyzing these young girls for the rest of their lives. And so what a way to show you're wealthy. I am so wealthy that my daughters will never have to worry about walking. And I make sure of it by breaking their feet. So it's an interesting way of fetishizing or exaggerating the female form. This ended in the early 20th century because it obviously is super unpractical. It's super dangerous. It can cause infection. It can cause all sorts of bone problems. And again, the girl can't walk, the woman can't walk. So now the only people in China where you can still see this are in very, very elderly women, right? So women who did the practice back or at the beginning of the 20th century, way back before it was outlawed. So it's essentially outlawed now. And so now they're the only ones left. You don't see women engaged in this practice anymore. It's, it's disappeared. Within the next 20 years, it will be completely gone because all of the elderly women who still are affected by it will have passed away. But we also have very modern examples of fetishizing the female form in South Korea. And that is through plastic surgery. So I talked a little bit about race in Japan before and noted that there's very little plastic surgery in Japan because they have a clear cut idea of racial hegemony. Whereas in South Korea, there is a very clear understanding of what South Korean beauty is. It is a certain eye shape, a very pointy chin. It's sometimes called the Korean V. Um, and any girl who doesn't fit within this particular vision, because there are a lot of different ethnic groups within Korean society. So anytime a girl doesn't fit within this very particular view of what Korean beauty is, it is recommended that she get plastic surgery. I have Korean American students that are like, yeah, of course I've had plastic surgery. Of course my Korean friends have had plastic surgery. It is a normal and accepted practice in South Korea. And what this means is you have billboards, like this is a photograph on top of a billboard this guy is walking in front of, and it's from subway station. And it literally says, mothers, do right by your daughters. Give them plastic surgery. And if you're thinking, okay, so I mean, girls get plastic surgery. Let me show you this image. These are the contestants for the Miss Korea pageant, right? And whoever wins this gets to go and compete in Miss World and Miss Universe, etc. These are the overlays of their photographs, one on top of another on top of another. That's what I'm talking about when I am saying uniformity. So in South Korea, women are fetishizing towards one doll-like vision of beauty and everybody is being made to match. It's a little unnerving to say the least. Of course, we would never have something like this in the United States, right? We would never have ridiculous plastic surgeries and wrapping up women's body parts in these sh strange shapes and strange forms and strange proportions. Like, we would never do something like that in America, where we would exaggerate the portions of women to such an extreme that they are barely recognizable in their biological form, right? And so what are some other ways that the female form is fetishized? One of them is in weight, in body weight. And this is actually really interesting because in almost all other societies outside of the Western world, there is a preferred ratio of sort of waist to hips. In other words, curvaceousness is preferred around the world. For example, when I went down to Carnival in Latin America, in Argentina, I mean, the curves that were on display and were socially accepted, nobody was expected to keep their curves under wrap. Women were expected to be curvaceous and that was seen as being attractive. And in fact, in many societies where there aren't a lot of resources, overweight women are prized. And so it's really only in the West where we have the model of the stick thin though this has been adopted in other societies thanks to globalization and the passing of American values around, we've now kind of moved in the last 10 years or so back towards the curvaceous model. And so in the US, we are starting to be more like the rest of the world. We've moved away from like the 90s, like heroin chic and moved back towards a more curvaceous perspective on. And another way that we fetishize the female form is through the concept of purity. Now, purity is a universal concept, right? And every society has this idea that things that are pure are good, right? Pure as the fresh fallen snow. And this can be everything from like 
food purity, cultural purity, language purity, et cetera, et cetera. So this is not necessarily directly related to gender or women or bodies or something like that, except that we do have this con conception of bridal purity or female virginity. So virginity is the idea of not yet having had sexual intercourse. However, there is most definitely not one clear cut definition of virginity. And that's because there's no clear definition of what is sex, isn't sex, what is virginity, blah, 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 blah. I can tell you one thing that virginity definitely is not, which is the breaking of the hymen. Those things have nothing to do with each other. And not all societies even care about virginity. Like large portions of, of social groups that are hunters or gatherers or pastoralists or nomads, in other words, who don't have the same conception of property, do not care about virginity, right? Virginity, as I'll talk about, is inherently tied to the concept of property and agriculture. Yes, really. And virginity is tied to agriculture, right? So a lot of societies that aren't heavily agriculturally based don't care about virginity. When a society cares about virginity, they care about female virginity. In other words, they again care about fetishizing the female form, in this case, fetishizing female sexuality. Now, where does the concept of virginity come from? And I like to use the work of Sherry Ortner. She is a political anthropologist and an anthropologist of gender. And a lot of her writings are really seminal in changing the way that we have thought about gender as anthropologists. And she argues, look, we only see virginity being important in historical periods and in societies where we care about property. And that's because virginity is really about inheritance. Most societies around the world experience male dominance. And so when property is owned, it is owned by males, right? And this connects to agriculture. If you put all this effort into your land, you want to be able to reap your own crops. And in order to do that, you need to control your own territory. So in male dominated societies, how are you as a male sure that the children that you give your property to after you die, that inherit your property, are actually yours. The only way you can be sure that your kids are actually yours is through the concept of virginity. Make sure that no one has impregnated your wife beforehand and own your wife's reproductive rights. Therefore, the concept of virginity was introduced as a way of being sure that men could control women's sexuality so that they could be sure that their inheritance went to their children. In societies where there isn't a large amount of property, virginity doesn't exist as a concept. So it has nothing to actually do, virginity as a concept, has nothing to do with women's purity or how clean they are or how healthy they are or how good they are or whether or not Jesus loves them or whether or not Allah loves them, et cetera, et cetera. At the end of the day, Virginity has to do with men being able to control who inherits their property. But as societies become more and more open with new ideas of inheritance, now that more and more women are able to own property and control who they want to have inherited, et cetera, the concept of virginity becomes more and more antiquated. And especially the idea of judging women based on virginity becomes more and more useless as a form of social construct and control. It ultimately just becomes another way to shame and fetishize women's bodies because we don't need to control women's sexuality in order to control inheritance anymore. We don't even really need to control inheritance every, anymore. We have laws to do that. But we still feel the need to fetishize and shame women's bodies and virginity is a way that we do that. Okay, thank you very much. And if you have any questions about gender, please feel free to contact Dr. C. She would love to answer them for you. All right, thanks for listening.